sort of disconnect there for now people are thinking. Then next, I want to talk about context, Lanper classifieds, as you see that R little picture there. I mean, without context, that would mean absolutely nothing, and you'll just be weirded out by this picture of a person putting an Indian headband on someone else, and uh, it makes no sense without context. So I just want to give you an overview of what we are about, and why Lanper classifieds, what's happening in the Lanper market, why agricultural vertical, why is it so important, what you can do there. And then lastly, how I applied the learnings and what we discussed at the Classifieds conference in Amsterdam. So, let's start with build it and they will come. Um, so, this is sort of my view on, on websites and the problem uh, in South Africa and South African tech. So, as I said, this is going to be unadulterated, so I could throw this slide in because it's not really, it's kind of applicable to what we do but it's, it might not be perfectly uh, down the line of the theme of what I learned at, in, in Amsterdam. What I want to say with Build It and They Will Come is a lot of people in South Africa uh, or tech companies wish it were like that. They could just throw a site up and people will just flock to it because it's so awesome. I've, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, literature out there that says uh, we are wasting our time with this approach and you should be better at marketing and people should know about your site and you should do on the ground activations, get on the back of a bucky with a megaphone and shout out in the uh, lesser known areas of South Africa that this awesome new .co.za is out there and this service will help save your life. And I'm saying let's take a step back from that, from all of that literature saying that's indeed the case. Let's rather say, make, let the data, and what I've got here is the engagement on the site that I'm viewing in the graphic, let the data guide us. So if you want, and it's so much easier, if you want to have a site built that is, uh, that you just, you don't talk to anyone, you don't spend anything on uh, direct marketing, maybe just a bit on digital marketing, all you want to do is you just want people to use the service. Measure your engagement. Engagement would be two possible things, three things maybe in my universe. The pages per visit of each user, the time spent on the site, and the bounce rate of your site. If you can get, if you actively drive those numbers to, um, towards the better of, so bounce rate being lower, pages per visit higher, time spent on site higher. If you just focus on those three numbers with your website or service or the new thing that you're building, and you just push hard for getting those up and better, you can actually do a build it and they will come service. You can. And I firmly believe in this. And um, this is sort of my product philosophy and how I feel about building anything or changing anything on websites. So for instance, let's give us an example. If you wanted to start a new e-commerce site selling uh, um, hats, then you could actually go and try and build it and do the build it and they will come approach. Okay, sure, there might not be a market, but let's assume there is a market for that. If you focus on getting those right numbers up there, getting engagement, that's the central theme of this book, getting that engagement up, if you really fo focus on that, you can do a build it and they will come strategy. So that sort of frames our talk for today. Now I want to move on to classifieds and, and what, what's the thing with classified sites, why are people so interested in it? So here, I've got an example of a site, this, the biggest uh, classified site in France, it's called Le Bon Quoi. And what it's about is selling everything and anything to everybody. So it's a to customer to customer site, so you might sell anything from a Bugatti Bayron to an uh, old discarded piano that you don't want anymore, everything online, pretty much the Gumtree OLX model that we've got in South Africa as well. Um, how the Bonkwa was started and why it's such a great story is uh, the guys from Shipstead who own this business, they saw that there was no classified site in the top 20 of Alexa in France, yet the guys that were there were making quite a bit of money, so, the, so they just saw the opportunity of really <coughs> going to the market, spend hard and have a better product, so make sure that the website works easier for users, users find it more engaging, remember our first slide and users spend more time on our site and then we should be able to make a big impact in this market. 
So I just want to give you some of the numbers of what Le Bon Coin is doing in France so that you can just see how big a business online classifieds can be. Um, it's actually, this is still, this is small compared to what we're going to do with NASPERS in Brazil and India with our legs. So this was just readily available on the internet. So uh, per month, 4 billion unique page views. Um, uh, I think uh, 38 pages per unique visitor. So that means each single user looks at 38 pages. I, I mean, that's just, that's just scary engagement figures there. So every single day, 300,000 new classified listings are posted. Uh, in a single month, more than 2 million people will essentially place a classified ad. And then revenue-wise, in 2012, they did 100 million euros. So as you can see, I think that's a, that, that's a pretty substantial online business. And the market for online classifieds is, is it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive market. And they'll, um, on, at the talk in Amsterdam, uh, they identified the three players in this market, big ones. Shipstead, eBay, Nasdaq. And they had the guy there from, um, uh, that used to run eBay in Germany, and, he, and he's now going to, uh, He's now part of the Nasdaq group, and he categorically stated with no vehicle, any, uh, he was firm of the belief that Nasdaq will easily be classified back worldwide. So just to confirm again, yes, guys, we are working for a great company. <laughs> so then what I want to move on to is context. What are we talking about with, with our plan, a classified platform? What is this, uh, what's this about? So. We've got an online website. It's uh, you can place a free advert, uh, uh, classified advert for an uh, agricultural-related product or service. There, what we did was we took the, the platform from a thing that I suppose could call Ricardo Dino, which is in Switzerland, deployed it, reskinned it, made it work for our for our sector specifically, translated it to Afrikaans, and we did that within about three months to a four month period, depending on how you view this. Um, we are also at a transitional phase there where we actually allow people to place the adverts in the print uh, magazine as well. And we now pulled that and we just three and on one. Uh, and then the two little phones there on the side, just showing that we also, all of the classified services we try and make available on our Lightbow application. And then the classified site itself is a responsive site as well. So what's going on in the agricultural classified space at the moment? Who, who's this, who are the strongest players? I'm just going to run through these quickly. The first one there, agri sales. What are they about? So if you ever, uh, if I've ever seen a guy doing a proper entrepreneurial job, you should go and visit Steve down in Brazil Natal who runs agri sales. It's just a print business with a, a, he's got a local printer printing his agri sales copies every week. You can literally walk down the road to them. He's turning a very healthy profit, and all it is is it's 180 pages of glossy, well put together advertising for uh, for farmers who want to buy new equipment, <coughs> new or used equipment, and it comes out on a monthly basis, and people love it. So they are like farmers go crazy for it. They just want this. They want to keep the, the uh, these booklets. So it is almost a booklet, I mean, 180 pages of glass. And they, and, and they just use it as a reference as to what the market is doing in terms of um, uh, tractors, etc. Because as you can imagine, all, in, all over the news we hear this thing of farmers are mechanizing more and more and more. And, that's an, uh, and, and, and you can see that in terms of the sales of agricultural equipment as well. So John Diano, for instance, in 2012, they made more money uh, out of sub-Saharan Africa than the whole of Germany in a year, which is totally astounding if you look at the, <coughs> think of the, 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 the global market there. So that's why it's a, it's a nice space to be in. It's a nice, agricultural equipment is a nice vertical with a lot of money exchanging hands. In commercial trader, that's sort of a, well, sort of piggybacking on the, on the well-known nature of auto trader. Again, print publication, not as glossy as AgriSales and not as big a, uh, a competitor for us or, or, or at least a, they don't have a dominant position, as a dominant position in the market, probably on par with what we do online. 
and then of course everyone's favorite the, uh, the Lanco Via Club magazine itself which is still and um, we do uh, bi-monthly experiments to test how the market is reacting to advertising so for instance I'll place a test advert in all of my competitions uh, publications or online or whatever as well as on Lanco.com and just measure the response that I get and in terms of response and what people really do, I can promise you nothing touches number yet. So I would I placed the ad for instance in I think it was February for a, a TLB which is a sort of a earth moving uh, earth moving equipment for a decent price and I put it everywhere. And the number of calls I got from uh, the online uh, various online sites in South Africa maybe between us and Olex and Gumtree and junk mail etc maybe three or four calls people inquiring how this is this thing in a good condition, etc. I had 300 calls in, in three weeks uh, by placing it in like Via Club in the magazine. So that's still sort of the that's the dominant player in this uh, agricultural classified market. So what we're doing is we're just ensuring that once everyone moved over to digital, there's still it's still the same brand that's actually being the, the dominant leader and the same company that's taking the money that's available in that market and, 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 and capturing that value. So that's the commercial landscape. Then what did I learn in Amsterdam? Now Amsterdam is a awesome place. I mean, I don't know if anyone has, any one of you have visited Amsterdam, I really think it's one of the better cities to go and visit in Europe. Not because of the uh, recreational activities that you can get involved in, but you can actually, within, within Amsterdam, you can pretty much walk everywhere, which is, and, and bicycle if you want to. I thought, the bicycling for me was but was more crazy than uh, I don't know trying to dodge taxis in South Africa. For me, the bicycling was just a bit too hectic. I'd rather just I walked everywhere, and it was it was so nice that you can you can get anywhere in the city by just just walking there. That's that for me was the best sort of non-work related part of, of Amsterdam. But maybe maybe that's something that we don't we don't emphasize enough in in this company. In my view. Um, it's so important to have the best people in your team. Um, I'm very, I was very blessed to have the, to work with the guys I've worked with this year. Um, but I, I really feel the emphasis is not enough. I know everyone's uh, everyone's complaining about the dearth of talent in South Africa and how difficult it is to find the right people and how there's no there's nobody who's skilled up enough or anything like that. But when I look at what's happening, just if you look over there. You see, there's a building. It's a grey and red building, and that's where Amazon is in South Africa. And by just paying people a hundred thousand rand a year more, they've been able to capture all the best software talent that's available in Cape Town. So, by I mean, in terms of if you look at it from a from a strategic or, or, or a big picture kind of view, that that money was really was nothing. But just paying people a tiny a tiny bit more, you were. They were able to they were busy uh, sucking all the great software and development talent out of the market <coughs> and capturing the value that great people offer you when, when you put them on the team. Sure, my view is a bit now in the software development universe. And I'm sure there are other examples like Amazon if we're talking about print or, 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 or journalism or whatever. But I think we should really, we should really, uh, as a company as a whole, rethink how we how we um, approach people and get the best people here. And if it means paying people more to, just to get the best talent, I know they'll I know it'll pay off big time because this is a great working environment and it is a great company to work for. The links I put on there, just two of my favorite sort of uh, business school uh, team, how to build a great team, uh, 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 fuzzy pieces. The first one I think were, uh, is the one about um, how do you build engaged employees? Don't want to talk a little bit much about that. The other one is the one that I found really interesting is if you want a successful organization, you have to have great middle managers. And that sounds so funny because what how do you how do you really empower middle management if the strategy always comes from a pie in the sky? And what they used as an example was if you look at a gaming company. So if I wanted to build big games like EA does, and I, I want to make, try and make money out of it, or, or Zynga, or, or any one of the mobile gaming companies that are up and coming now, 
And what they do is that they really have a very strong middle management structure where the middle managers and the guys actually making the decisions day to day on how the products should evolve and what should happen and so on are absolutely responsible and are relied upon to make things work without that much of a, 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 a input from on top. Just, just sort of letting those people loose and let them uh, go wild with product and making sure that things work. And I think it's very, it's a very big, it's the, I've never seen that sort of happen in a South African environment because I think we're still a very paternalistic society with, with, a, with a very strong autocratic leadership culture. But the, I'm hoping to see, so I've, I've seen in this country at least, I've seen a lot of movement away from that and how people are, are moving towards giving uh, responsibility and accountability to, to middle management, which I believe will solve a lot of problems. That and hiring the correct and the best people. And that attitude and work ethic, that's sort of my only criteria when I want to, when I hire someone. So on the CV, I can see if someone's qualifications and experience is all right. So if I were to hire a software developer, for instance, I would never code this thing. You know, this is going against the grain. But, uh, I mean, if you look at what Google published recently, they said also the code tests and the math tests and all of that is not an indicator of performance. Um, so what I do is, is I look at the CV and then you either in or out, right? It's like, so did you do the X, Y, Z in your life? Did you accomplish X, Y, Z? All the references, see if that's a okay bad person. And from that shortlist, I'm only really interested in people who I know will work hard and who's got the right attitude. And by right attitude, I mean, I, I, it's, it's really important for, for me that people will like their work as much as they like their personal lives. I know this sounds weird because you always want the magical work-life balance thing, but you're spending more time at the office than you spend at home. So at least like your work as much as you like being at home or whatever mountain biking or other hippie thing you do in your free time. Like, at least like your work as much. So that's what I'm looking for when I'm talking about energy. So then that's, that's the team bond. So then the emphasis from in Amsterdam was also very much on, on being mobile first. And they had Luke Roblevsky there, who's sort of the guru on being mobile first. And he, he, he had a slide deck of about 300 slides that he sort of jumped in and out of certain sections of this deck and it's amazing to see a guy who's, uh, who's used to giving Silicon Valley presentations how they manage a slideshow, just never mind the content of it. They've got essentially got a big stack of slides somewhere on their hard drive and they can just jump in and out of, into certain sections and they know where it is. It's, it, it, it's really a, it's, a, it's almost a performance <coughs> one to give proper uh, presentations and, and, and deliver slideshows uh, like that guy did. And really the emphasis in terms of mobile first was not to not to say mobile first and, and mean we are building also now building a mobile site and, and we are now build, we are now also give, making our product on a, available on a mobile phone. It means if you ever have a, encounter any functional change, for instance if you were told that your website now has to go responsive for some lack of a better word, then what you do is, is you build the mobile version of the responsive site first. So don't go and, and talk, spend hours in meetings uh, talking about how the desktop experience should be. Just disregard it completely for now. Go and focus on making the mobile experience right. And then once you're happy with that, go on and see, okay, cool. Oh, this is how it'll scale to the desktop. You'll often find that your technical team will have more, uh, it'll be easier for them working that way around because you'll have You've got more. Uh, uh, you've got more information density on a smaller screen, so you have to sort of solve all the big problems to get it working right on a small screen. And then once you're going to the desktop, you're like, oh, okay, great. Uh, things have things have fallen into place. And uh, for me, that was sort of the eye opener uh, in terms of what they, uh, from what Luke said at uh, at the conference. And then what we did, how, how this impacted our business was, we had it. Uh, we had to make a change from uh, a month ago, from moving from being able to place adverts in the print publication on the Vierplatt directly from the web, and we had to switch to a completely free online only model. And so I asked the developer guys to try and when they built this new version of Checkout, because you can imagine there's no more uh, 
but if you want to place an ad in a magazine, you need to have all kinds of extra information that you don't need when, you, when you're doing it only on the website. So changing the forms and changing how it looks and feels, ask them, let's do it first on the mobile phone. And I think that I think it, it, it worked well, and I think it's I think it it made an improvement. The, what have I learned about marketing? Well, that it's so difficult because I'm I'm really not an expert on marketing. Um, but what I did see, what, what interested me was um, if you can if you, you can actually track the so what you, what what are you really buying if you're marketing? online service, you're buying pages, you're buying people's eyeballs to get to your site, right? So you've got all the various channels lined up, whether you have TV budget, whether you have print budget, or maybe, maybe a lot of online spending. If you've got online, you've got multiple channels, whether it's Google or banners or whatever. But try and measure what, what each channel, what it costs you for, uh, what does it cost you to get one page view? Uh, or, or how many rands for one page on all the channels? And then you can easily sort of compare and weigh them against each other. And then for me personally, what I wanted to do for for Lightbow is spend more on long tail Afrikaans keywords. Now, what does that mean? That means if people are searching for, um, <coughs> sure, I don't know, uh, kunain flies, which is uh, which is rabbit meat, uh, they might only be 200 searches. Uh, in a month for that specific thing. But the chances are that I'll have something similar on but classifieds that people would like if they're searching for that. And nobody will be buying that keyword, right? I mean, it's not like um, it's not like Gumtree will spend a lot of budget on good name for us. The, I mean, so I can get that click towards our classified site for rather cheap. I can get it for, I can pretty much buy all 200 searches. If I, spend, if I just spend a tiny bit more, which will still be less than any one of the big keywords like find flights, Jova Cape Town, or buy a house, Cape Town, you know? So that's sort of the, the other thing that I found. And the, if they, the other one that I thought was quite interesting is this, if your competitors are spending big on TV and you can't spend on television, go and spend a bit on Google advertising. So go, if you know that your competitor is spending a massive amount on TV advertising right now. The chances are they are pretty much they are communicating this uh, the same message and the same job that, that people want them to do for them. They are communicating that. And what you can do is you can actually leverage that by, by punting your brand. So if you see big advertise, TV advertising update from one of the competition, spend a bit more on Google advertising during that break for your service people will still be searching for buy car and then even if you're second a lot of people will click on that because they saw the ad on TV or even if they don't mind the brand. Then the last thing and this is something that I'm breaking my brain about at the moment uh, because it, was, it seemed such a powerful idea and maybe this is something that you can use in your business as well but a very little marketing in South Africa or at least that I know of has been done around seasonality so whether it's, uh, whether it's in the, in the wine industry, for instance, you know that uh, there's a certain time of year when you, like at the end of the summer, sort of uh, January, February, where you have to pick the grapes, etc. And how do you how do you change your marketing and your advertising to cater for seasonality in, in, in your industry? And um, yeah, as I said, I haven't cracked it yet. I don't know what I don't know what to do with this powerful concept of people being focused on certain tasks during certain times of the year, but I can imagine that there's a lot of opportunities there. And the guys that did this successfully in, in Thailand, that, that, uh, which were displayed at the conference, really made a big impact by, by, by exploiting the concept of seasonality. The analytics, so what I learned about this. Um, this little diagram over here uh, has f uh, sort of five areas where it, where, you, where we had to say where are we good at and where where do we want to be and where are we currently. So management, scope and objectives, tools, methodology and resources and I plotted us uh, on, on that little uh, pentagram there because we are, it's being enforced from the top down. So we've got an iPad application called Dashboard which is a nice pass wire dashboard that's, that we have to report from and those are the only numbers that count. So you can imagine if you had a business where this wasn't enforced, 
it, 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 it actually makes a big impact in the business because now you've got one set of numbers and one standard set of rules on how you need to report on your figures and I think that's a, that's a good way to, to measure properly. Then, uh, scope and objectives, I think here what I mean is, um, uh, so I said they measure per category and I did that. Uh, what, what I wanted to see is, is, what's the difference between, say, pets, advertising pets on the site and advertising tractors? How are people interacting with the site? Do they have more pages per visit if they go onto tractors? Or do they have more pages per visit if they're going to the pets category? Or maybe in property? And if I'm looking at, uh, as one would expect, sort of naturally from common sense, property has a great pages per visit, great engagement. Once someone is in there, they're looking at a lot of properties. A lot, lot of farms, a lot of um, uh, houses by the seaside, etc. And that was quite a, bit, a nice win for us when we presented that in our previous review, just showing how the engagement tracks per category directly from the learnings that I had at Amsterdam. The resources, analytics, I upskilled as soon as possible. I essentially upskilled myself and the the. the uh, got certified Google Analytics expert that all the, that all the, the, the online stuff that they've got available now and I'm feeling very much more comfortable within the analytics environment. Um, I think we are, uh, in general, I'm, I haven't, I, I feel I'm like bottom through all when it comes to international skill level on analytics and I haven't really seen anybody, I've talked to, talked to a lot of people, hey, can I maybe get, a, can get your analytics expert in to find out how you guys are doing analytics well and, and, and so on and nobody has one. So if you were wanted to do a career change or something, just become a Google Analytics expert in South Africa if they don't exist. Um, then tools and data sources, what I say is segment better on traffic sources and that's still something that I want to do um, that I haven't got around to yet and that is to know if people are coming from your paid search traffic versus so paying for keyword traffic on Google versus someone coming with direct traffic or or maybe even from other sites that link into your site, how do you how do you properly measure the engagement of these users? Um, because it, I mean it's important. Let's say for instance I had a ad on Gumtree for Lumpa classifieds, and people clicking on that were highly engaged. Then it will pay me. It'll pay off in the long term. Just drop more ad budget into Gumtree because I'm getting good quality users that are coming from Gumtree using my stuff. And then methodology plus emphasis on analytics. I think that ties into my point of how to, um, uh, there's such a dearth of talent in analytics uh, that I'm even making sweeping statements such as uh, there are no experts in Then the other thing that I learned is this thing about uh, how we can do network effects better on the classified site. Um, and for us, that'll be to get more listings. So luckily we were able to go free because what that did for us was we could easily ramp up in terms of listings. And what does that do? So you get better data, which in our case means more data, with more photos as well, because I've tried to get uh, the platform allows people to easily upload photos which drives more visitors to the site because I'm telling you about, I'm telling Nick over here, I'm saying to him, look, I found a great bargain on a tractor on Lumbar.com. Go have a look. I know you're in the market for, uh, for a <coughs> Labrador puppy, and I know that, uh, that, that you'll find it on there. So that means it comes to the site. It's a new user. And then lastly, the third circle over there is enterprise adoption in our case, which would be small uh, distributors of, uh, farming equipment that maybe have no advertising channel whatsoever or they don't want to spend big budget on the magazine because it's quite expensive to place an uh, uh, advert in a magazine but now they've got maybe 200 or 300 uh, second hand tractors that they want to advertise so I, if I get them on I immediately get quite a nice, nice bump on my total daily listings figure which again drives more users it improves my data, more visitors come to the site, as you can see, that's sort of a reinforcing unit right there. So then, lastly, the slide about the wins, what did we do here? So firstly, let me show you this one. So that's that's our site's engagement measured right there. So you can see I took a screenshot to show you, it's not, 
it's not even Photoshop. We used to be at 4.5, now at 8. Uh, 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 as you can imagine, I mean, that's, a, that's nearly a doubling of, uh, of the, the pages per visit for the average user on our site. What did you do for doubling your page view? This. Just, okay, optimization. Better data, getting enterprise adoption, more visitors to the site, more users. You've got more listings, more things for people to look at, more photos on the site. It means that you'll get better engagement for people. So that's the that's the big one there. People spending a minute extra on the site. It's still nothing compared to hour and ten minutes per visitor on average on the one. So it's we're getting there. I mean, I think we had seven minutes now. Something like that. <laughs> and then in terms of our mobile usage. In two months of the iPhone application, we've had better, uh, we've got on average better daily, higher daily active usage than we've got on our two year old iPad application. So I think there's a, uh, there's a, that's a big win for me and for my team personally as well. So that's, that's pretty much my story around what we did uh, or how I did and, and what I learned in Amsterdam. So lastly, I was hoping that people have some questions and then we can chat about those. So thank you. Well, Good morning. Steven. Um, two questions. So the NASPA is taking over the world in terms of classifiers. Do you think it helps coming from a print background to bring the brand across? Or is it just that where they've chosen to take on other there on others in the market? Because it seems to me that sort of like Craigslist, first to market, seems to dominate the market and then it's very hard to break into yep. a classified market. So that's my first question. And secondly, do you, as a data buyer, do you uh, have some data in terms of conversion? I mean, when a consumer goes on or reads a newspaper, I don't, from my perception of classifiers, I wouldn't be as sort of um, honed in on a certain ad and then convert into into buying that certain thing. Do you find that the conversions are higher on online? Do you have some sort of comparison for us? Great, so, okay, so the first one, um, uh, I don't think, to my personal view, I don't think uh, being good at print classifieds can be actually a um, Online is a different game. Uh, then secondly, um, the conversion rate, well, it's impossible to measure what the newspaper conversion rate is. The best I've got is the, my experiment of the 300 people phoning me from my project, but right? Because a, a phone call in the classified business is a conversion pretty much. Because then the, the, that's what you want to do. You're not selling, you're not really selling uh, the products. And that's something that's a big difference between how I feel about classifieds and online retail. Is online retail, you're selling a specific product to like people to get to the thing generating leads for people. So, in terms of the online conversion rates, I think it's it, it can be on par with what you do on this. Obviously, you can measure that and try and, try and get those higher and so on. So, you can get 3 to 4 percent or 5 percent conversion rate on, on replies, which counts as a sell in our case. <coughs> and, and I mean, from, from print, it's difficult to see because you can't measure a page because you can't have the 300 phone calls divided by circulation. It wouldn't be a Fair thing because it's, it won't be that all of the people maybe the, the classified section of the, of the magazine. If you just say, I don't care how things look, I want my people to find it easily. So, for, the great example there is booking.com. Just go on booking.com, look at how ugly they find a hotel for me. It's, it's a big orange button, it looks <coughs> it is not in proportion or anything, but they do 10,000 deploys per day. Even the, that site that you mentioned, we're getting from France, that, that, that classified 100 million, what was their revenue model? Where did they make the money? Um, so they were, they've got a, a, you place an ad for free, but you can be a featured ad for $30, or you've got a super ads on the right hand side that's even more premium. So I think it's about three or four tiers of, of advertising that you can buy to get your listing viewed by more people. What's your visit to Amsterdam? Uh, what sort of scenario is there with online test flights versus print test flights? And the situation would be in 
you expect things and what you picked up was that thing abroad. But in the next five years in South Africa, what's the for us about it? Um, well, there wasn't. I, I mean, I don't, to be blatantly honest with you, the only exposure I've got to print classifieds is what I've seen in my experience <coughs> with Lampo Vierkblatt. And, I mean, and, and just the historical stuff of how big a business it used to be for newspapers, now it just essentially collapsed, right? So that, that's, that's the exposure that I have to, to print classifieds. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the next five years, I think a lot of people are a lot of people are talking about the next often you know, the next five years when, when people are in a print environment and I don't think we should I, I think I don't think that should be the frame of mind. We should just think on how we can be the best in any environment. So if, if I'm thinking for Land by Vierkblad, I'm thinking let's make sure that the, we get all the agricultural classifieds that's available in South Africa on Land by Vierkblad. <coughs> because then I know that people will just by the virtue of network effects, they'll, they'll come and look for second-hand goods and leads, they'll come and look there. So, think of how those, I don't know, if those channels are strong, we'll stay, maybe it'll stay strong in print for Lampo Vierplatt for the next 15 years. Because it's still not, I mean, just from that experiment of mine, it's still so, so small, the uptake online. And, pe I mean, people are still collecting, like, they've got, like, staples of magazines, even angry sales magazines which is an entrant, a print entrant from 2011, which I mean, if anyone starts a new magazine in 2011, people will just laugh at them. But in the agricultural sector, it works perfectly well because the market is simply, they have not migrated towards digital yet. So that's sort of my thoughts on it. I don't know whether it really answers your question, but, but, but I think it's, it's absolutely important if you look at it from a, what, are, what are my customers want and just giving them what they want. Stephen, um, Lunpo is quite a niche sector for, uh, for classifieds and that's probably why it does so well. Do you think that Media24 has opportunity in other se sectors that our magazines are available in, so for example bicycling or uh, I think another one now, um, or will the big general um, cross-vertical um, classified sites like OLX or Gumtree win over the smaller niche? Um, a million hiring companies in South Africa. So that means there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of this uh, segmentation in the industry, and then often you can do a you, you can do a classified play. Same with um, with property. I mean, you've got a million estate agents. So if you're looking at any sector that you want to start a niche or a vertical classified business in, think of where there are which industries have these pockets of massive segmentation. So where you've got dealerships all over the place. Then, then it means you've got a chance of building a vertical on that. What sort of the, if, if any, is there any view on Africa and South Africa in terms of classifieds? Because Europe and the rest of the world, smartphones are you know, pretty much a time that does it. We find a large uh, portion of the African and South African population don't have smartphones. So going mobile first, you know, there's a massive, massive market there. How are we even looking at that? Is there, you know, aside from the normal desktop, but you know, is there ideas how we can engage those market or that market that's got maybe the lesser type of devices, etc. Et yeah. So, so the biggest, uh, I mean, the biggest success story for me that I know of in the group in that regard is <coughs> Doc Bachus, which sits in Indonesia, and they are doing crazy numbers, millions of pages per day. Um, and they've got more mobile traffic now than they've got desktop traffic. And those mobile, guess how their device profile looks? Exactly like South Africa, still people hacking around with blackberries. So, how, so, I mean, absolutely go for, if, if there's a big play in Africa, it'll always be the mobile play because, I mean, that's just how connectivity works over here. And, hey, uh, someone, someone's going to, uh, I'm sure that NASPAS will, will take the African market classified as well. It's just that because I don't think any of I don't think eBay or Shipstead really cares about it. They don't think that they they just invest in selected markets and, and in <coughs> traditionally developed countries. Well that's our challenge. Uh, in Europe you have FTP really smart phones and here you have more feature phones or basic uh, like Blackberry and we have the challenge to adapt our services to these kind of 
mobile phones, what the Europe does and you know, have that to do. So I think for that part, uh, we really go to India or other countries or South American countries where also they have the same uh, uh, mobile uh, structure or profile. Um, just to give you another example, the Ricardo Lino site that we, or platform that we use for our ads uh, come, came from Switzerland. And in Switzerland, their um, Google Analytics figures, I saw them, uh, the mobile phone usage there on, the, on their website, and they do, they do millions of visitors each month, so it's a big site. But for some weird reason, they like, I think if, it's if their neighbor gets the new phone, they need to have it as well, that whole competitive type thing. So they've got the latest phones. Don't ever be... Don't ever think that the farmers in South Africa or those lazy gentlemen sat with a straw hat on their head and, uh, and looking into the fields with a, with a uh, uh, what do they call it, a, 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 I don't know, a dam and sheep and, and all of that in the background. It's, it's not like that. They are, they are technologically advanced, man. <laughs> Yeah, so that would be a market a marketplace where you do the where you buy the actual products, but that's not the that's not that's a different model. So that would be something like eBay or maybe even a, a local example would be a little buy. So that's a where where you put in something that people can buy from you. The site takes the money in escrow and pays out and does all the things for you. But that's that's a that's a totally a different service. This is this as I said. This is a classified to really a lead generation so it's, it's customer to customer, not to business to customer, or business to business. I understand what I'm trying to find out is if they actually add online web base or pay to print. If it's just an ad, it's got the same effect. The online ad would be more effective if it's got online shopping components. If you turn around time the, the actual advertiser or the retailer is going to have the effect of this So we haven't reached that stage yet. The sense of online, online shopping, online advertising. Well, I don't think that's the I don't think that's the unique selling point for online classified service. I think uh, uh, the big advantage that you've got from print is that you literally categorize things on the fly. So if you're looking in a magazine, uh, I don't know whether you've seen the back of a like Bavier plug yet. It's a big bunch of classified ads. If I'm looking for some, if I want to browse tractors in the magazine, I've got to page a lot of pages to get there. And people still love doing that in the agri sector, but I mean, the newspapers, they clearly don't, because we've seen those pages shrink and shrink and shrink. Um, because online, all you can do is you type in, I want to search for, I don't know, I want a new for, uh, new polo. Type it in into our Lexel company today, and you'll get hundreds of examples of, of guys selling polo second hand, which is much, but much better curated list of stuff that you're looking for than you would have maybe in, a, uh, in, the, in the print product. So I don't think the classified, this classified model is not to say, hey, here's my, here's my phone, I'm selling it, and one click a buyer buys it, and I deliver it to the buyer and make, the, make a profit on the transaction. The margin on that, the margin on selling goods on the internet, if you look at what a Amazon already gave us the end game there, they already gave it away. Amazon's margins, 1%. So we saw we, we can just see where it's going. It's 1%, so you've got to be a volume leader. So that's where, on, where the online shopping is going. Classified margins, 70%. Because you're asking people to just promote their advert.